If you've never done a CTF before, Pico CTF is a great place to start. It's got some very beginner topics and then it's got things that are a little more difficult. I've never done a CTF before. I'm not a full-time Linux user. I have a few Linux web servers, but other than that, my Windows box is my main computer. So I'm going to walk you through the CTF, some of these challenges I've already done, and the other half I've never done before. So Pico is made up of three parts. You have the Unity game the challenges themselves, and then a shell built right into the browser. The challenges range uh, from very easy, like the first few warmups, which you're just converting hexadecimal to binary, uh, decimal to ASCII, and that type of thing. They have some really basic ones that almost any of them can do. This just prompts you to read the page source. You'll find one third of the flag in the HTML, one third in the CSS, and one third in the JavaScript. And then you combine those all together and you have your flag. So this is basically something that anyone can do. Um, I'm going to start off with something more difficult so I don't bore you to death, and then we'll go through the rest. So the first one we're going to do is handy shellcode. The program executes any shellcode that you give it. So let's go to the shell and let's navigate to this directory. And if we see what's in there, we have a flag, the vulnerable program, and the source code. So if we try to read flag with cat, we get permission denied. Uh, so let's run vuln. And let's just enter some random shell code. And thanks, executing now, segmentation fault. So let's read the source code. If we, it's a very simple program. Uh, it creates a buffer. This is just basically so you don't lose permissions, so we just ignore that. Creates a buffer. It asks you to enter your shell code. It calls vuln, which is up here. It basically gets your input and, and puts it into buffer. And then it says, thanks, executing now. And it calls your buffer using a function pointer. So whatever code, whatever shell code we put in there, it will execute. Basically, what we need to do is we need some sort of shell code that's going to give us the permissions where we can read that flag. So I've never done anything like this before. So this was a good learning experience for me. Uh, I just did some Googling. And then what I noticed was these lines here uh, give you a little hint. Uh, this prevents bin slash sh from dropping the privileges. So we it sounds like we want to execute this, right? So what we're going to do is we're going to spawn a shell that has the permissions uh, to access that flag. And hopefully our the shell that we spawn is going to have the permissions that we need. If you Google this up, you will see it's a very common exploit to do. And so what we want to do is we want to call this function uh, exec ve. You pass it a string, which represents the path to a file. And then uh, these are arguments and environment variables for the program that you're calling. The second two arguments don't matter. This is the only one we care about. So what we want to pass in there is slash bin slash sh. Now this is a system call, so we need to know how to call a system call. So I did some more Googling and ended up on this page. It shows you that using interop 0 x 80 it calls system calls. And then the calling convention is right here. EAX is the syscall, and then the rest of the arguments get passed in the general registers. So this first uh, variable that we're going to put in EAX is going to be the syscall number. I found the syscall for exec VE to be 0 x uh, b, which is 11 in decimal. And then the, the next two arguments are just going to be zero because this takes two more arguments. So we need to fill this argument, push two zeros to the stack, and then we need to call the system call. So to do that, it's just a few lines of assembly. Uh, it took me a while to figure this out, actually. But here's what it looks like. Uh, it's one, two, three, four, five, six, seven lines. Uh, first, what this is doing is it's pushing the slash bin slash sh string onto the stack. And then we are getting the string pointer. We're setting the, uh, the arguments to zero. And then this is calling it. So we're going to go over each line of this now. So if we go over here and type in slash bin slash sh, we will get the hexadecimal equivalent. Now, this is not a null terminated string. We need it to be null terminated. So we're going to add uh, a zero byte at the end. So this is from left to right. This represents the ASCII of the string. But 
we have to push it uh, onto the stack in reverse. So if we go back to here, just paste that in right here, we can see why are we using push and why are we using two pushes? Well, the push, push instruction is five bytes total. The first byte represents the push instruction, and then the following four bytes is, is the 32-bit uh, variable that you're pushing on to the stack, right? In this case, because we're on a 32-bit operating system. If we look at this and look at it in reverse, we're pushing 2F62, 69, 6E, 2F73, 6, 8. And then what you don't see here is that null terminator is right there. So essentially what we're doing here is we're getting that path string and we're putting it on to the stack. Why are we doing that? Because that's the easiest way to access uh, that string. Because we, if we're, if we're executing, we have control over the stack, right? We don't have to like get any special memory uh, permissions to put the string somewhere else. And then uh, this function, it takes a pointer to the file name, right? So then we need to push the uh, string pointer into EBX. So as we know, we just push the string onto the stack and ESP has the, ESP holds the address of the last thing that's pushed on the stack, right? So we move the stack pointer into EBX. If we remember here, parameter one is EBX and then ECX and EDX, we're gonna set those to zero and we just do that by moving in zeros. Then we wanna do the syscall so we move 0xb into eax, which is our syscall number, and then we call interrupt 0x80, which is going to execute the system call. Pretty easy, right? So with this website, it makes it real easy. It drops you your uh, string literal for your shell code right there. So that's what we're going to get the program to execute. So let's go back to our shell here, and uh, let's execute the program, and let's paste in that code. Segfault doesn't work. I was really confused here. I had to ask for our help. Um, a friend, Hacked Hacker, helped me with it. this, so shout out to him. He showed me how to process that uh, string literal with the shellcode, and then how to pipe it into the vulnerable program. So to do that, we're going to do echo slash en. The en tells it to interpret the uh, new line character, and then we're going to input our uh, shellcode. And the last thing we're going to put in there is a slash n for a new line. And then we're going to end that, we're going to cat that, and then we're going to pipe it into the program. I'm a noob with bash, so I need some help with this. Um, and then this should work. Enter your shellcode. Um, it's executing what this slash n actually does. It's kind of like pressing the enter key, because um, this, uh, where is it, the puts here or the gets is waiting, it's basically waiting for your input to end. So doing the slash n tells that the input has ended, it's printed to the screen, and now it's executing. So right now we're in that new shell that we just created. So let's do cat flag.txt and see if it works. Cool, that's our flag, we did it. I made that look easy, but it literally took me like six hours, so. So now that that cool challenge is out of the way, we'll go back to some of the easier ones. But first, let's grab our flag and see if we got it. We did, cool. So the game's actually pretty cool. This first challenge has you collect some things inside the game. I'm not gonna bore you with any gameplay. So the first other challenge is the glory of the garden. The garden contains more than it seems. So let's open this bad boy up. And it's just a picture, nothing secretive in there, just from looking at it. Uh, this one's very easy. So let's grab that string, uh, that path, and let's go into it. And let's see what we got. We have garden, so let's just cat that file and just read the, the binary data, right? And when we get to the bottom, we see there's our flag. This is a good uh, confidence booster, I'll tell you that. Um, next one, we looked at this already. This has this website with the three portions of the flag. So we have the first one in the HTML. Then we have CSS and JavaScript, right? basic components of any website and then the last one's right here got a space in there okay let's warm up if he told you a word started with 0x70 in hex uh, what would it start with an ASCII you can google this any ASCII chart uh, will show you we look at hex and go to 70 it is a lowercase p The numbers, what do they mean? All right, we're downloading a picture. 
So a bunch of numbers here. It's in the Pico CTF format. I can see that right away. So let's uh, write this out. So this is, let's do bigger. And it's a P I C O C T F. And then the other letters, do any of these numbers match up? We have a T for 20. It doesn't look like any of those other numbers are there though. Um, we just looked at the ASCII chart, so we'll consult this again. At first when I did this, I thought I was gonna have to use like a frequency analysis to see how many times the characters uh, were there. Cause like the letters E, uh, S, T, and A, those are like really frequent, frequent letters. But in this case, it's just a straight translation from the numbers. So P is right here, capital P equals 16, capital I equals nine. So all you do is match up the numbers, easy. So it's Pico CTF, uh, T, H, E, and then the 14 is an N, U, M, B, I'm sure this says numbers, right? Num B R S, yes, and then 19 S, and then 13 is M, A S O N. The num the numbers, Mason. Interesting. Got to put an S in there. I think this one they have you do this week, a different format, all caps in this one. Cool, we got it. Uh, warmed up. What is 0x3d base 16 in decimal? So base 16 is hex. So we put in 3d and we convert base 10. That's, what is that again? 61. Can you convert the number 42 in base 10 to base 2? So 42 in base 10, that's decimal. And we're converting it to base 2, which is binary. Easy enough. Let's see, practice run. You're going to need to know how to run programs if you're going to get out of here. See what's in this folder. So we want to run this. And it just gives us the flag. Super easy. It's basically just really easy stuff just to get you started on CTFs, right? Can you unzip this file to get the flag? Oh god, I don't remember I don't remember how to unzip in Linux. I could just open it in Windows though. Are you kidding? Oh, it's too easy. Unzipping is easy in leap speak. Okay. UNZ1PP1. Oh, you idiot, right? Too many eyes. Um, vault door training. Your mission is to enter the laboratory. If you have a source code, you will need to read the source code. Oh, it's a Java program. And all we have to do is open the source code. And we see that the password is our flag. Cryptography can be easy. Do you know what ROT13 is? Yeah, so ROT13 is just a rotation cipher. It rotates every letter um, 13 spaces. Do we need to convert that? So this is easy. If we look at our ASCII chart, let's look at um, the first letter is P in Pico, right? So if we go down to P, this is number 16 of the alphabet, right? So if we add 13 to 16, I'm sorry, we gotta go down to C. Yeah, start with P. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13. So that's how we get the C from P. And then we can just type it into rot13.com and it'll give it to us right away. What does this mean? Well, it's alphanumeric X, basically. So usually that's uh, usually that's base64. So if you go to any base64 decoding website and plug it in, you will get the flag. Learn the ropes. The one-time pad can be cryptographically secure, but not when you know the key. Can you solve this? I'm actually going to skip that one. I haven't solved that one yet. That one's kind of tricky. So let's move on to the next one. First grab, can you find the flag in this file? So we will open this guy. We go over to the shell. We will go into that directory. See what's in there. 
and we have file. If we just cap the file, it's just a bunch of mumbo jumbo. We need to do a grep. Do I remember how to grep? That is a good question. Um, oh my God, work this again. Go. Yes, we got it. Cool. We got it. Overflow. This should be easy. Overflow the correct buffer. I'm going to do that in a second video. Actually, I think I know how to do this one. Uh, overflow. So let's go over to that folder. See what's in here. Uh, at bone.c. Let's see the source code on this. Seems to be a error handler. This is just like in the in the last buffer uh, exploit thing. So we're opening flag.txt, and if it's null, flag file is missing, and then we get the flag. We open the, basically we're opening the file and storing the data into the flag buffer, it looks like. If there's an argument, then execute vulm with the argument. Vulm just uh, string copies from input to buffer and prints it. Okay, so this is interesting, right? I, I really don't know what all this means, but it looks like if you trigger an error, then this handler is going to print the flag, right? It's basically like an error handler, and then it's gonna print whatever's in the flag buffer. So all we need to do is trigger like a segmentation fault or something like that. So why don't we just try and put too much data in here and try to trigger that? So let's try to trigger that. We'll do dot slash volume. And just give it a big argument with more than 64 characters. And it yeah, that's what happens. It did. It, it faults or errors or whatever, and then it dumps the buffer. Cool. I thought that was going to be hard. All right, resources. We put together a bunch of resources to help you out on our website. You should go over there and maybe find a flag. Okay, this one's way too easy. They just literally list it here. They're trying to make you read the resources. Funny. I should do that in GH. All right, this looks like just a basic Caesar cipher text, which I think is just a rotation cipher, just like uh, Rot13, right? So let's go over there and cat that out. And so we need to figure this out. Copy it. Just go online and uh, dump it into any decoder like this. This site actually brute forces them and gives you a bunch of options. So if the rotation is a positive 7, positive 13, or positive 17, those are likely values. It seems to think it's this one, crossing the Rubicon and then some random characters. That's the only one that looks anything like English, and that's a plus 7 rotation. So go back to 10, J, let's subtract 7, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, we get a C, right? And that, so gives us, that gives us crossing the Rubicon. So yeah, I think that's it. Let's copy that. Submit, and that's it. Cool. Don't use client side. Can you break into the super secure portal? Let's see. This is secure login portal. Enter valid credentials to proceed. Incorrect password. So let's uh, view page source. And... We basically are doing a submit, and it calls verify, and returns false. And then if we go to verify, it has this annoying kind of like obfuscation here. Let's grab this. I think this is just the flag written like kind of obfuscated. So I copy and paste that into Notepad++, and we see it's uh, checking the substrings, and the range is from zero to split split times 6 to split times 7, and so we see split equals 4, so I'll just do a find and replace, make my life easy. So it looks like the first four letters are Pico, duh, and if we, let's order this by, by where the range begins, right? So Pico, and then it's this. And then it's 4 times 2, 4 times 3, 4 times 5, 6, and 7. Oops, and we forgot the 4 right here. So now it looks like it's Pico uh, CTF. No, C, no clients, please, EE2F24. Two two Interesting. Weird challenge. 
Yeah, that worked. I'm curious, though, is that, like, the password? Password verified. Yeah, cool. Factor is hiding th all things from its users. Can you log in as logon and find what you've been looking for? Okay, so it said login as logon, so it doesn't even check the password. Let's just try password. Everything's been so easy so far. Logon, logon? Nope. Logon admin? Nope. All right, let's see what's going on here. View page source. Uh, nothing special here. There. Let's uh, look at the dash here. Nothing in console. Sources. This is it. Same source we already looked at. Network. Uh, ch -ch -ch. Format. Application. Uh, cookies. Password. Logon. Username. Logon. Admin. False. What if we just set admin to true? Ah, too easy. That was actually kind of fun. Okay. Got it. Strings it. Can you find the flag in the file without running it? Why, certainly. Let us go back to the shell. Let's go there. Let's see what's in here. Uh, strings. So strings is a program that will dump the strings that are in the binary. So we just do strings. Strings, I guess. Um, that's a ton of strings. You can see, I think they put these S strings in there just to mess with you. Uh, so, uh, hmm. Strings. Uh, well, we know Pico CTF is like seven letters, right? So we can do strings dash n seven strings, and that'll give us only strings that are that size and larger. Except, of course, there's a ton of those sons of bitches too. Um, another thing we can do is strings strings and pipe it with less, and then we can basically each time we hit enter, we get the next one. Um, I don't see Pico in there either. Uh, Control Z to get out of there. So what we want to do is we want to strings it, and then we want to grep it. So we're going to get the strings output, and then we're going to grep for Pico. And there it is. Cool. Hey, look, I actually know what I'm doing. All right, I'm going to stop there. We've done about half of them, and I'll do a second video on the second half. Hope you enjoyed. Peace.